Hi, everyone. Welcome to our rounds today, June 2nd. We've got Dr. Tony Jerome Recchi, which um, I believe everybody knows. Um, he's spent the last 35 years in practice in Muskoka and Perry Sound, and he's been with West Perry Sound since 1994. Welcome. Uh, should I get started then? It's 12 o'clock. Sure. Uh, and you're happy to have people interrupt if they have questions? Yeah, uh, if, if uh, there's questions, let's uh, do it at the end of each subject. And uh, I've got 10 subjects, so I'm going to kind of move very quickly. And I've got a few sort of demonstrations as well to do uh, throughout the talk. So if I run about five minutes over time, hopefully I can be forgiven for that. Uh, the whole point today is I wanted to cover... Uh, as I said to Kathy, this is probably the last time I'm going to give grand rounds anywhere. It's not that I'm retiring. It's just that it's the last time I'm going to give her grand rounds. So I, I kind of want to go out with as practical a talk as I can. And what I really want to do is, is go over 10 subjects that not you might see and emerge. You will see and emerge. And I want to get you through those urological problems ASAP. I don't want you to get stuck on them. I want to kind of get you from A to Z in three to three to five minutes, just with the practical things that I'm going to pass out at you guys. So let's get started, if you could. Uh, uh, I got handouts there from Kathy. They're they're in print form. Um, I like to when I whenever I do rounds, I like to leave a kind of a printed uh, record of the talk. Let's talk briefly about urinary retention. You will see that in the emergency department, guaranteed. Uh, sometimes every second day if you're working in ER. Let's look at the pediatric age group first. In terms of the pediatric uh, patients, you, you're not going to see that much urinary retention. Uh, it'll be much more common in males than females. And the cause is almost always in the typical ER setting related to foreskin issues. Not likely to be posterior urethral valves or anything like that. Usually it's quite a bad phimosis. And there's a history of a tight foreskin. And when the child or infant urinates, the foreskin tends to bloat out and it, uh, it's called ballooning of the foreskin when they void. And that frequently is accompanied by a urinary tract infection if it's bad enough. A bedside ultrasound in the emergency department is a useful thing to do there. And uh, interestingly enough, when you look at the foreskin, you will sometimes think, how in the world can that child void? through that tiny little opening. Well, they, they can in most situations and they can empty very well because their bladders are new and they're aggressive and they're not decompensated. So if you can get a, a bedside ultrasound on them to make sure they're not retaining, that will be very good. And, and you, most of the time you don't need to catheterize them. Uh, you will see that uh, um, there's not a lot of retention. Generally, you can get away with local measures. You'll see uh, probably a redness of the foreskin. And that all you really need to do is have uh, saline impregnated soaks, some antibiotics, broad spectrum like uh, amoxicillin and some topical steroid cream. That will solve most of the problems for you. That'll solve probably 90% of the problems. However, in that small percentage of pediatric patients, if the ultrasound does show that they're in retention, you can use a xylocaine gel, and it's amazing how they dilate. Xylocaine is actually a fantastic dilator, even if you kind of poke it into the foreskin and uh, insert it, it usually cracks the, cracks the skin open very nicely. Xylocaine, by the way, is also used to dilate ureters when you're going after kidney stones as well, so it's a great dilator. And maybe just enough to allow you to put a catheter in Let's say you do have to catheterize a little tight. Well, probably the safest thing you can do is use one of these, the five French infant feeding tube. Especially in a, in a male, it's, uh, it's uh, very atraumatic. It's atraumatic for a female and it can be used if you're, if you're worried about pyrexia NYD. Now it's only five French, you can see it's pretty small. So don't expect urine come pouring out put a syringe on the end and suction the urine out. Just otherwise you'll be waiting for half an hour for the bladder to, uh, to, 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 to drain out. If they're a bit bigger, you can go to an eight French infant feeding tube, but generally a five French is very, very atraumatic. You won't, 
hurt anybody. You won't injure anybody. Now, the child sometimes needs sedation when you're passing a catheter. The parents always need sedation when you're passing a catheter. So they're actually going to be quite aghast at all that's going on. In terms of catheters for youngsters, an eight French pediatric catheter uh, is the smallest catheter that has a balloon on it. It has a little plastic stylet. But after the catheter goes in, the stylet has to be removed and the balloon can be blown up to th three cc's. One of the uh, problems with retention as well is paraphimosis if the foreskin is stuck, stuck behind the head of the penis, they'll have a reluctance to void because they will have a very sore penis. We'll get into that under topic seven. The urinary retention in females is usually not that common. You will see it in neurogenic bladders, typically type one diabetics. Uh, they're usually the real thin, well uh, controlled Diabetics who have looked after themselves for years, they often are the ones that go into retention. It's the uh, type 2 diabetics uh, uh, who generally don't have problems with retention. The one person that you're going to see, a female uh, in, in the eMERGE department, is going to be the very frail female, that real thin little immobile lady who is rolled in from a nursing home uh, in a fetal position, not responding really to anybody. You examine them, you may find their bladder to be up to their umbilicus, and there's no clue that, that they're full. They get no discomfort. They've kind of disconnected from their bladder sensations. And there'll be a fairly easy catheter placement to do. But look for the thin, bedridden, frail female who weighs 80 pounds, dripping wet, and she'll be the one who will be in retention more often than not. She'll probably come in with a bad UTI or something that's not right, and usually a, an attends on her. Standard Foley's for an individual of that description are usually a standard 14 to 18 inch. Just wanna give you a couple of practical points about a, a very obese uh, uh, lady uh, who might be difficult to catheterize. And more often than not, if they're really obese, you're gonna have difficulty. But the way you can get a catheter into them is to, you're gonna need some help. I recommend putting two pillows under their buttocks, get some good light feeding in and a couple of helpers, one on each side to spread the labia. Usually you will be able to see the uh, introitus and you can pass a, a catheter probably under direct vision in that circumstance, but you can't do it without some help. If for some reason everything is optimized and you still can't see a catheter, I would uh, you can't see the urethra, I would recommend using a coup de catheter generally try and pass it towards the very top of the introitus and see if you can engage. If you can't engage, then I'm just going to tell you one additional little step. And that is, if you cannot see the urethra and, and, every, and the laid hair spread well and the light is good, take two fingers and place them into the vagina with your left hand, assuming that you're right-handed. Place them into the vagina and you should be able to feel the urethra even if you can't see it. What I would recommend is taking a straight catheter like this, bouncing it off the web of your fingers and pointing it in the direction of the urethra. Very often you can engage what you cannot see. And you, you quite often, more often than not, you'll get a, get a good flow of urine. So that's a, it's a tricky catheter to place on somebody who's obese, but you need some help with it. The female urethra is only a couple of centimeters long. You do not have to put the catheter in all the way as you do with a male. Male retention, a big problem here. You're gonna, that's the one that's gonna, gonna cause you problems. The urethra is long and pretty much you're obliged to see urine before you blow up the balloon. The story that uh, I sometimes hear is, well, the catheter went in just fine, but we got blood back. Well, the catheter did not go in just fine because you're not there. If you don't see urine, I don't recommend blowing up the balloon. Catheter in a male should go in all the way. In other words, this is the standard catheter, for example, a coup de tip. It should be in the penis to that point where you, that's all you can see, and you should be seeing urine. If you're seeing urine. If you're not seeing urine initially, suck back on the uh, outflow port. It may just be gel blocking the port. But suck back, make sure you got urine, and then you're free to blow up the balloon, and then you can pull it out a bit till it catches. But if you're not seeing urine, I don't recommend you blow it up because you will get fluid back, but it won't be urine. It'll be blood. It needs to go in all the way. 
any male over 30 years of age, use a coup de a tip catheter always up towards their head and don't be stingy with xylocaine gel. Use a ton of it, use at least two. And pass the catheter briskly. Don't, don't be gentle about it. Just pass it quickly. And they have a, a, a difficult passageway. Usually speed helps. It gets it around the corner faster. But one thing you may run into when you're catheterizing somebody, uh, if they have a really, really big prostate and you tie a 12 French catheter and a 14, catheter may just get bunged up in the prostatic faucet. You won't get it in. Well, I suggest you go bigger. Take a 16 or an 18 French coup de tip catheter and pass it quickly. Again, a couple of three xylocanes. But uh, if, if they got a big, big, big prostate on physical, you really should use a bigger catheter. You'll have less likely for it to kink and get stuck in the urethra. You're gonna have problems with people who had stricter disease and possibly a previous TURP. Uh, again, if you're not seeing urine, don't put your luck, don't blow up the balloon. Because if you blow up the balloon in the urethra, you're gonna have a mess. If you blow up the balloon in the prostate, you may have a bigger mess with acute prostatitis and urosepsis. And that's when they start getting the low blood pressures and they don't look good and they need a ton of fluid. My default catheter in the emergency department, guys, is a 14 coup day. That should work for most people. Two gels and a quick passage. If it gets stuck in the urethra and you can't advance, please do not blow up the balloon. If the ultrasound shows retention and uh, you're not getting urine out, don't blow it up. Not a good idea. One other, one other little trick. If you pass the catheter in and you're, you're right up to the, to the apex here of the catheter, and it start, before you blow it up, it starts to get spat out and it kind of comes out like that. You're not in. If you're in the right place, that catheter should sit there and not move. But if you're in the wrong place, it'll kind of just eject gently like that. And you're in the wrong place. Don't blow it up. Okay. So a um, couple of things as well. People, sometimes I get people who worry, worry about carcinoma of the prostate that's been treated with radiation. Uh, you don't have a problem there. That's not a, a typical problem. Feel free to catheterize if you need to. Now, it's a little different with somebody who's had a radical prostatectomy. It means the prostate has been removed. Uh, in that case, you're, you're probably better off, about the only time in a male that you, a straight catheter will work better than a coup de tip because they're missing the uh, prostate. And usually it's a straight shot and it goes better than a, a hooked catheter. That's the end of part one. Any quick questions here? If not, I'd like to go on. Yep. Go Sorry. ahead and unmute yourselves if you have a question. If not, uh, we'll go on to uh, gross hematuria. Again, not something you might see in eMERGE, something you will see in eMERGE, sometimes on a daily basis, depending on the week. I gotta tell you that uh, since the advent of the new, new anticoagulants, such as a Pixaban, my job has gotten a bit, bit heavier. A pixel, uh, warfarin for some reason was always sort of urologic, ur, ur, urological friendly type of agent, but a pixaban and its cousins, I got to tell you, that's doubled my workload in terms of hematuria. You're pretty much going to see that in elderly males quite often. I just have to remind you the two most common causes of gross hematuria in a male are BPH number one and bladder CA number two in that order. In the female, it's UTI and bladder CA in that order. Hematuria in children is rare, but most commonly due to a urinary tract infection. Much less commonly in second place is IgA nephropathy. You're not likely to see that too often. Uh, key decision points in the emergency department with respect to hematuria is how bad is it? Is there a lot of clots or not? And probably the one question you have to ask is can they still urinate? And if they can, don't feel an obligation to stuff a catheter into their urethra because their urethra is 32 French by itself. If you put a little tiny catheter in, you're not gonna, you're not gonna do them any favors because the outflow port might only be about eight French. If they can pee and they're passing clots, let them pee. So don't, don't obstruct that idea. So most can void without any problems. Uh, if, if, they're, if they have hematuria, don't expect to see a lot of white cells on the urine sample unless it's fairly dilute. But I can tell you that uh, I always, pretty much always put people on antibiotics with gross hematuria and for some reason it worked. 
so I would recommend that even if even if you can't see a lot of white cells on the sample, because very often the white cells get swamped by the red cells. If you don't, uh, the only reason you really need to keep them is if their hemoglobin is low, or if for some reason they are completely unable to void. On your physical, try and get a try and get a quick feel of the prostate if you can. You do the standard history of physical the labs, get an ultrasound. Contrast, if you can, that's great because it tells you it's not coming from the upper tracts. Throw in a cytology and refer to urology in that case. Uh, I used to generally not scope uh, gross hematurias if they were non-smokers. Lately, I've been running into a pile of people who have been non-smokers and they got bladder CA. Some of my biggest recent bladder CAs are actually non-smokers. So, uh, they probably should be followed up at least as an outpatient. If a person has a lot of clots and they can't void, um, I'll tell you, you're not doing them any favors uh, if you put in a little 16 French three-way catheter. That's just not, that's just no catheter at all. If you're really serious about getting them declotted, don't take a little 16 French three-way. Get one of these big honkers. It's called the Dufour catheter. You can get it in the operating room. This is a 22 French put a ton of xylocaine in the urethra and pass it with a tip up. And I can tell you automatically, you can withdraw a bunch of clots from their bladder because this catheter does not collapse after it goes in. But you gotta make sure you got a lot of xylocaine in to freeze them and that you can run a decent CBI through this. If you just have a tiny little 13 French or 16 French catheter, if you cut that catheter across and look at it, the outflow port is almost invisible. You're not doing them any good. If you're serious about putting in a catheter, put in a big one. Don't be shy. Uh, if they're able, if they're able to void and they're having blood clots, uh, make sure their hemoglobin's okay and they're probably dischargeable with hydration antibiotics. Otherwise, they'll have to be admitted on a three-way CBI. Urinary tract infections, uh, guys. Any questions? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to uh, part three. Are we okay so far? Everybody happy nobody's, so far? Nobody's no, no. put anything in the chat box yet. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm sorry I'm flying along, but I want to cover all 10 topics. I know it's, uh, the, the Kathy has the, the hard copy handouts for you guys to keep if, uh, if you so desire. Urinary tract infections, most UTIs you're going to see are simply because it's somebody from out of town who does not have a family doctor and doesn't know what to do when they get a UTI. Typically a female, there's not enough uh, family doctors, not enough uh, clinics to deal with this. And they often show up in the eMERGE department, pretty much know how to treat those. Most will be afebrile dysureas with a little bit of hematuria. If you have a chance to get a bladder scan, that's nice because it tells you they're not in retention. If you have a chance to peek at their kidneys, you'll know that they're, they probably don't have a hydronephrotic segment, which is quite nice. Uh, it's good to know that. If they, if they don't have hydronephrosis, whole situation. Uh, a more complex situation is, the, again, the elderly frail female who comes in probably non-copus mentis, curled up in a fetal position weighing 80 pounds. They're the ones who will have urosepsis. They'll have the high fever. They'll have the... Uh, the uh, attends on that and, and will smell terrible. Um, that's that's the one you got to worry about because they're going to have retention. They won't be able to tell you that. Oddly enough, people who are middle-aged and more mobile and uh, even people who have a bit of extra poundage, they, they don't generally go under retention. Seemingly being able to move is the prerequisite to be able to urinate, especially in a female. Males are a bit more complicated because of the, the prostate, you, you have to decide whether they have sepsis or not from the prostate. You have to decide if they're in retention. Uh, somebody with acute prostatitis is going to be really sick. They're going to have a white count that's, that's high. They're going to be febrile and they're going to look like garbage. Many of them will need to be admitted and rehydrated and given antibiotics. It, seemingly dehydration and UTIs, they're, they're cousins tied together by a short cord. Uh, my rule of thumb is if they look sick, they are sick. And it is amazing what a couple of liters of normal saline will do for somebody who's sick like that. Might be antibiotics. You might actually be able to get them out of your department and home. 
with good hydration and some intravenous antibiotics. And it, it's truly amazing to me how these people are so wiped out by UTIs. They, they, they feel like it's, it, they take weeks to recover. You're able to uh, get them uh, fluid rehydrated with aggressive antibiotic use, even through a saline lock as an outpatient. You're gonna save them an awful lot of morbidity because if they sort of hydrate themselves at home, that takes a lot longer and they'll be sicker for longer. You have to catheterize somebody with acute prostatitis. You really gotta be gentle here and use the smallest catheter you can get away with. Usually a 14 CUDE and, and throw in two or three xylocaine gels. Be really gentle about it. Uh, some, some of my fanatical teachers used to say, put in a suprapubic, but it, that's not as easy as it sounds. Suprapubic not an easy thing to do necessarily. So you can put in a simple little catheter uh, and relieve them. The other one you gotta worry about is a pregnant female who comes in with a UTI. You must consider them as a complicated UTI every time they come in. They're gonna have right-sided hydronephrosis by definition from the second trimester and on, but they won't have left-sided hydronephrosis. And if they do have left-sided hydronephrosis, it's probably a renal stone, and they probably have symptoms to that effect. But every UTI must be treated as a refluxer with a potential for pyelonephritis. So this is somebody who, generally speaking, I admit on IV fluids observation, serial ultrasounds, and IV antibiotics. The antibiotic choice has to be good. It has to be baby-friendly antibiotics. And anything that can kill a cell wall and a bacteria is, is, is baby friendly. So the cephalosporins are good, the penicillins are good, generally speaking. Ceftriaxone is one of the greatest inventions in history, in my opinion. Okay, renal colic. Are we okay to move on to renal colic, guys? Um, there used to be a stone season in the summer in the dead of winter up in the scope of Perry Sound. Now stone season is year round. Uh, I don't know why, but people are getting them year round. And of course, now that we're coming into the summer, the only reason people come up to Perry Sound and Muskoka, I'm certain, is just to have a kidney stone. They're not here for vacation. They just want to have a kidney stone. And that, uh, so you're going to be swamped with stones, our guys. Uh, the, the questions you have to answer in the emergency department basically are about five. How do I relieve their acute pain? When are they dischargeable? How soon? What do I give them on discharge? What follow-up is needed, if any? And who are the ones I should worry about, i.e. admit and watch or treat ASE? The presentation is, is pretty classic for renal colic. It's pretty unmistakable. Very severe acute pain, sudden onset. Most of them have, seem to have had a stone previously can't find a comfortable position on the stretcher. And they have this curious phenomenon. They, they'll, they'll have, they probably will have a systolic blood pressure elevation, but most of them, even if they're 80 pounds dripping wet, will have, a, will have an elevated diastolic blood pressure. And that's because the renal colic stimulates the renin-angiotensin system to drive the diastolic blood pressure up. Vomiting is a absolute signature of renal colic. Somebody comes in with a fever and some nonspecific flank pain, but hasn't vomited, they may just be a pyelonephritis. But vomiting is so common, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendous stimulus to the splanchnic nerves. And it's a very good thumbprint for renal colic. Tachycardia is also a, a pretty good thumbprint for renal colic. If they have a white blood cell count up to about 14,000 in their afebrile, I don't worry quite as much, but if they start getting a white count up to about 15 to 20,000, attempt anything over 37.5, I start to get a little twitchy about that. That's the kind of patient that I think I would like to observe overnight with an IV and IV antibiotics. So anything, white count, anything above 14,000, that's kind of my rule of thumb. Anything over about 37.5, even, even 37.1, I get a little bit concerned about because these can often turn into 39.7s and they can, uh, they can decompensate. 
most of them will settle with analgesia in 30 minutes to about four hours. The IV fluids and hydration and analgesia are a must to get them comfortable. Um, expulsive therapy, a lot of people use Flomax. Uh, mixed reviews, I, I actually very much like indicid suppositories, 100 milligram suppositories. I don't know why, but they, they, they seem to be fairly user friendly. They, are, they don't cause a lot of DI upset and they're a very powerful prostaglandin inhibitor and a dilator of the ureter. Even stones up to seven millimeters, I've, I've had even even bigger up to eight millimeters have passed under the influence of indesid. So expulsive therapy is useful. They used to use prednisone, by the way, which I don't endorse for that. But the initial studies that found uh, amsulosin uh, uh, were combined with uh, with steroids, and I'm not a big fan of oral steroids. Uh, the imaging is 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 an ultrasound or CT, depending on the circumstance. It's, a CT gives you more information uh, if you can get that. Um, urine analysis, uh, not all, you're not always going to have microscopic hematuria. Typically, a two millimeter stone, they're the ones that cause the most trouble. They go all the way down to the bottom of the ureter and they get stuck. So in that case, you're not going to have a lot of hematuria showing, and you may have a patient who's really having a lot of pain and a lot of hydronephrosis. And even when you have uh, that sort of report that they may have a perirenal uh, fluid collection, that's often from a little two millimeter stone. It's not the big one centimeter stone that's rattling around loosely in the renal pelvis. That's not gonna get into the ureter and block so perfectly. I find the little stone gives the big, give the biggest problems initially in renal colic. Uh, perinephric fluid is often reported. Uh, not usually crisis if these people are not septic. I used to worry about that. I used to treat them. I, at more often than not, that settles with the, with your treatment. Now, here's the people you have to deal with, you have to admit. The ones with intractable pain, that's pretty self-evident because they're going to be pretty non-functional, rolling out the door, writhing. Those with sepsis, that's obvious. The, the pregnant patient, even if doesn't appear that she's that septic. It's uh, it's probably best to observe. Anybody who's dehydrated and unwell needs to be rehydrated. And the one, the one, perhaps the most treacherous patient I found in the last thirty plus years is the obese type two diabetic. They're a disaster waiting to happen. They're the ones who will have the white count of maybe fourteen point one, have a temperature of thirty seven one, but they have a dickens of a time passing their stones. And many of them go on to septicemia. So I do not easily release those patients. Watch out for the obese type 2 diabetic. They are a problem, an accident waiting to happen. Okay, subject five, scrotal masses. Uh, sorry to keep zipping through here, but we'll probably open it up for questions at the end then. Uh, but I want to get everything, uh, if we can, all, uh, all tidied up for you guys. So at least you have an, an approach that worked for me for, for years. Scrotal masses, um, it's something that you will see. You'll definitely see this in the eMERGE. Not so much in the neonatal and pediatric age group, but if you do see this in the pediatric age group, it's often a hernia, worse with crying, and the ultrasound will say hydrocele, but that by definition is a hernia. Make sure there's no bowel on the ultrasound. Uh, that usually uh, uh, is a problem, and you might want to seek general surgery in that case. Prepubescent males can occasionally sneak up with a, a really rare testicular CA, in this case, a yolk sac tumor, which doesn't behave in a malignant fashion. You're often going to get a report on an ultrasound that says epididymitis on a young, young child. True epididymitis really doesn't happen all that commonly. What it usually is the result of is a, is a torsion of the appendix testicle, uh, the very top of the testicle, right beside the epididymis. That gets torted and gangrenous. It reaches over and irritates the epididymis. So they will have what looks like epididymitis. There's very few eight-year-olds who have true epididymitis that isn't a torted appendix testis. That's often diagnosed by examining them uh, and feeling the top of the testicle, at which point they'll, they'll jump. Talk about the blue dot sign if it's a thin scrotum. The ones to watch out for in the scrotal masses are the post pubescent ones, the tall, thin young males. 
they will often have a varicocele and often they'll present with pain because a really bad varicocele can cause acute discomfort. Uh, torsion is possible even with relatively little pain. Hernias are also common, but this is the age group in which carcinoma of the testicle sneaks in. And I've, I've had uh, probably six or seven patients in the last decade who've come into the eMERGE with a painful testicle and it did turn out to be a non-seminoma, either in brinal keratocarcinoma or the much dreaded choriocarcinoma. I, I'm, I'm always haunted by choriocarcinoma because I, I had a young fellow who had a half centimeter choriocarcinoma uh, with uh, enzyme levels that were off the map. And uh, he subsequently developed pulmonary masses and died before he was 18. So that's the one tumor that you really don't want somebody to have as a choreo. Uh, if they do have testicular CA, you, you should get imaging on them as soon as you can, including retroperitoneal imaging and blood work. In adulthood, your likelihood of a testicle starts to go down uh, up to about 50. It's more common to get epididymitis, hydrocele spermatocele, et cetera. In older patients, epididymitis dominates this group by a wide margin. Testicular carcinoma is extremely uncommon in this age group. If it is present, there's often a lymphoma present and that's only part of their presentation. Even a unilateral tumor uh, in, a, in an older person is, is probably a uh, probably wide disseminated lymphoma and probably a B-cell lymphoma. The painful scrotum is something you will see, and I just want to give you my take on painful scrotum. Uh, generally speaking, I would say, who do you ultrasound? You ultrasound everybody. You ultrasound everybody. Assume torsion in all ages and in and, and, uh, and all presentations. You, you really should get a Doppler, color Doppler ultrasound if you can get it. Uh, here's what happens in the case of a torsion, just to give you an idea of the time frames you're looking at. They've had pain up to 12 hours and it's a true torsion. You're not going to have any issues if you can get it untorted. No major issues, no lasting damage. 12 to 24 hours, there's measurable damage in terms of the most sensitive function uh, in the testicles, and that's spermatogenesis. And you will see potentially that testicle being fine. It'll be fine for hormonal production, but it won't be fine for spermatogenesis. Over 24 hours, the viability of most testicles is seriously in doubt. So really, they come in like with uh, with three days of torsion. Uh, the chances are that uh, not, it's not going to be successful. I've taken several to surgery after, after 48 hours, and basically the testicles look blue, small, and mottled. Uh, some of them pink up a little bit, and I give them the uh, benefit of the doubt. Um, and, uh, but I have had uh, testicular torsion, uh, and the youngest patient who ever had a torsed to dead testicle was three years of age. That's, that's what kind of scares me about this. You really shouldn't make any assumptions. The oldest I've had who had a torsion was 65. So who do you look for? Who are the trouble, trouble, uh, trouble people? Well, it's basically the tall, thin, young male. The, the same guys who are prone to left seals are prone to testicular torsion. You may have one even living in your house, actually. I call them the high school basketball player guy that you gotta watch when they roll into a merge uh, with, with a painful testicle. True torsion in the, uh, in the uh, uh, younger male, uh, pre puberty group is unlikely. It's more likely to be a torsion of the appendix testis. The story is not at all dramatic. It's the child has probably been in school for several days with the discomfort. Uh, it's it, they're still functional. They can walk. They kind of walk with a broad-based gait. They're not in desperate pain as they are with torsion. Um, and uh, they usually come in after five o'clock on a Friday with a, a petrified mother in tow. Um, and so they they are they may also have an epididymitis uh, because of the adjacent uh, torsion of the appendix test. And usually you can get away with antibiotics. And, uh, and rest is usually good, and ice packs are, are useful as well. Acute pain of the scrotum can also occur from a really bad urinary tract infection with rapid swelling and rapid onset of epididymitis. 
Uh, in point of fact, I think I've only removed probably four or five testicles from uh, infections that have gone off kilter. They're usually in very unfit diabetics, um, people with marginal hygiene, seemingly. Uh, your epididymitis treatment of choice is Leviquin, seemingly these days, for the um, typical acute epididymitis. I'd always recommend that you stand your patient up in the emergency department when you're examining them. You'll get a lot more information. Even if you don't have an ultrasound available, stand the patient up. If the testicles are hanging symmetrically, where is the pain? Uh, can you feel the testicle? And are these people functional? Do they move without pain? Can they, they walk around? If, if, they're, if they have a mass, the appearance of a mass that's kind of rolled up and higher than the opposite testicle, that is most certainly a, going to be a torsion. Uh, and the ages, basically 13 to 45 with a bias towards the 13 year old. If you can't decide, just call urology. That's, us, that's up to us to make our best guess. Sometimes untorting can happen spontaneously. Sometimes it, uh, it can happen uh, uh, by doing the opening the brook procedure. As you may remember, you've been taught that when you're looking at the patient and you're standing there in front of the groin, turning the testicles outward is thought to be method of detorting, but you have to be, you have to give them a lot of painkiller. You may end up being the victim of a broken nose because these people are in a great deal of pain. Penile issues, part seven. Okay, pediatric uncircumcised male. You're going to see them uh, very red, inflamed foreskin, usually a crying child, anywhere between about one and five or six years of age. Mentioned uh, these are children who have ballooning of the foreskin. They can usually get away with saline soaps, hydrocortisone, and amoxicillin. And again, if they're in retention, you might have to call urology. So, in in terms of foreskin discomfort and foreskin redness and problems, and look for the type 2 diabetic. It's not the type 1 diabetic, the, the long-standing insulin-dependent one. It's the type 2. These frequently get, um, get uh, bad phimosis and bad balanitis. Paraphimosis is where the foreskin is trapped behind the head of the penis. And uh, what I would recommend in that case is you ice them down with the ice packs for a bit. And I'm gonna show you how to, how to deal with that in a second. Ice them down and give them some painkiller. I just wanna show you how you approach them, how you do this in the eMERGE department. This is a model. So if the foreskin is back here, this is the head of the penis, it's usually bloated. I would recommend starting your procedure by squeezing the head of the penis to get some of the edema out. And then what I recommend is taking your second and third finger like this of each hand, putting it behind the swollen foreskin, leaving your thumbs free. And what you're doing is you're going to be pull after you've dried the penis, you don't want to do it while it's wet from the uh, ice packs. What you do is you pull the foreskin up as you're taking your thumbs and pushing the head of the penis down. And more often than not, you'll be able to slam dunk the head of the penis back into the foreskin and then you're fine. Occasionally it won't go and occasionally they need a dorsal slit and that's what urology is for. So remember the V approach, second and third finger, very snugly, thumbs free. Uh, the glands of the penis has been squeezed for a bit and then you're pushing down as you're pulling up and you can probably just invert it and boom, the head of the penis will disappear back under the foreskin and they'll be fine. They won't go into retention. They'll just uh, they'll just feel a lot better, but they won't thank you for it because it's kind of painful. But GU trauma, uh, much more common seemingly in summers. It tends to be a motor vehicle accident or a sports injury or a fall from the ladder. Uh, often gross hematuria is present, but don't be led astray. If even if there's microscopic hematuria and they had a bad fall you can have a, a devastatingly bad injury. So this is the time when you need to be on high alert that they have a problem. Uh, you really need, do need to do a CT with contrast. You're obliged to look high and low. Um, and they can often be accompanied with other injuries as well. A renal injury in isolation is not all that common. You have to also look for other injuries like intestinal injuries. Very often, if they require laparotomy, it's not going to be for the urological cause. It'll be for 
possible and possible injury. There's two types of injuries. There's the blunt or the non-penetrating, and there's the penetrating. The non-penetrating is much more common. Again, the tea with contrast is a must. You've got to know if the urine is uh, still present uh, in the collecting system or is it spilling out. You have to know that. Most of the time, the patient with a pure renal injury, even if they've got a big hematoma, will not bleed to death. The gerotis fascia is fantastic at, at controlling the bleed. And so you really don't want to interfere with that. So if it's just a pure renal injury and they got a big perinephric hematoma, just watch them. You, don't, you do not have to have something done to that. It does not have to be open. In fact, that's a contraindication. A sharp tra traumatic injury like a knife wound is usually accompanied by other serious injuries and very often intestinal or duodenal or other serious injuries. Rare to get a uh, knife wound in isolation just of the ureter uh, or, the, uh, or the kidney itself. Ureteric injuries usually happen by shearing. There's often an underlying problem such as a congenital ureter or pelvic obstruction from a shear injury like that. You're much more likely to see a bladder injury from a seatbelt, a motor vehicle accident with a full bladder. We'll have uh, some hematuria. Uh, again, CT with contrast, you've got to use the contrast. Don't, don't do it without contrast. Occasionally, you'll get a, a, a devastating bladder injury with a dismal catheter attempt frequently in a nursing home on a Friday night. And you have to determine from the CT whether that is that urine is extraperitoneal, which is behind the peritoneal cavity or intraperitoneal because the difference is a matter of life or death. If the uh, contrast is flowing into the abdominal cavity and outlining the uh, intestines, they need a laparotomy right there and then to close it and to disconnect the abdominal cavity from the uh, urine. Otherwise they will, they will get significant electrolyte problems very quickly. If it's an extra peritoneal injury and there's just basically urine behind the bladder and cracking up behind the peritoneal cavity and into the retroperitoneum, and usually getting away with a catheter, well-placed catheter is all you need. Pelvic trauma can happen usually with a fall, often a carpenter who's working uh, on a construction site, rattle injury. Uh, what you will have is somebody who cannot urinate. Uh, on CT, you will have a prostate that may be displaced. You might have blood at the meatus. When you go to examine their prostate, you might not even be able to feel it. It might be kind of high, and then they're in a retention. Before you even try a catheter on somebody like that, when you suggest that they have a disruption, what you might want to do is a retrograde urethrogram. And how do you do that? Take a 14 French catheter, slice the end of it off, and put it into the urethra about two centimeters or three centimeters, and blow up the balloon only to about a PC in it or two cc's. Don't, don't blow it up fully, it'll hurt. And then what you do is you inject some contrast under a fluoroscopic control, see where that fluid is going. If it's going into the retroperitoneal cavity, you know you have a disruption and they probably need a supercubic tube initially uh, to, uh, to, to decompress them. The urethral injuries, we see them all the time. It, it, it appears axiomatic that nursing homes always send their most junior nurses complicated catheters on a Friday night. Uh, regrettably, that is, a, that is the case. And very often, there's a lack of recognition of how far in a catheter needs to go on a male patient. And that's usually the underlying problem. Sometimes you'll get somebody coming from a nursing home with that much catheter sticking out of their penis, and all they've got is a ton of blood. Well, of course they do, because the balloon has been blown up in the urethra or it has uh, been blown up in the prostate and this person is, is sick. And you can expect that they will get sicker if you don't do something about it. So that's the kind of person you have to call urology for. An aberrant catheter placement is, is a problem, but with a flexible cystoscope and a, and a little guide wire, sometimes it's an easy fix. So that definitely, uh, nobody would criticize you for calling urology for it. Um, Testicles, our next um, sports injuries, straddle injuries, or fights. Key issues are you've got to ultrasound the testicle. You have to, you've got to ultrasound the testicle. You have to know is the capsule complete and what is the blood flow. Otherwise, it's an exploration. If you don't see the capsule all the way around, you've got a disrupted testicle and you've got spermatic testicular tissue 
hanging out in a hematoma and that's not good because these people can get a, a, a sympathetic reaction in which they can develop, if you will, a, a strong reaction to their good testicle and they may lose both of them. So that's an exploration. The things you have to know is A, blood flow, and B, is the capsule complete all the way around. Penile injuries frequently occur with a fairly rough sexual activity. A corporal fracture is usually accompanied by a pop and a great deal of discomfort, followed by immediate detumescence of the erection and with uh, blood defluxing into the subcutaneous tissues, but not including the glands penis. It'll look like a, 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 a rather large sausage by the time they arrive from the, from the, from the corona of the penis on down. Uh, probably blood tracking. They are immediate surgery. They have to be operated on because that's not going to get better. The corpus cavernosum has been fractured. They need to have that stitched up. Bladder pain. Urinary tract infections, for the most part, are the cause of most bladder pains. Um, for infants, you can use, as I said, a five French infant feeding tube if you need to. Uh, for older patients, a urine sample should be fairly, uh, fairly accessible. Urinary retention will also cause uh, bladder pain. Uh, interstitial cystitis with negative urines and a small bladder on ultrasound. You'd be amazed how many times you'll actually see that in the emergency department. And you just don't get a lot of gratifying findings that point to anything else. Foreign bodies, I, I, I typically see them this time of year. It's amazing how many uh, people think that the urethra is a storage depot for unusual objects. Uh, so foreign bodies are possible. Chemical irritation, sitting in a bathtub with, uh, with soap cracking up the urethra. And carcinoma in situ, the bladder is also a, a, a cause of bladder pain. Last but not least, this is something that you're very likely to see in this catheter problems. Okay, very often people are, are worried about patients who pull a, a catheter out with a balloon blown up. Yes, they will have plenty of blood, but believe it or not, if the catheter is pulled out by a confused patient, it's being pulled out in an antegrade fashion, and that actually means that the urethra is still intact. It may be bruised, it may be traumatized, but you usually haven't put a divot in the urethra anywhere. So the chances of getting a catheter back in are excellent. You don't need to fear that too much. You can usually put in another catheter fairly fairly easily if it's pulled out by a confused patient. But a suprapubic tube that falls out. Your success in getting a suprapubic back in is gonna depend on how long they've been without that tube. If they come in right away, you can try the same size of catheter and don't be shy about putting it back in. Use, use xylocaine down, down the pole of the suprapubic tube. Try and get the same size catheter in or if it doesn't work, you'll probably be able to get something two French smaller in. For example, if they came in with a 16 French suprapubic tube, try it 14 French. If they've been urinating through the urethra for a, a fairly lengthy period of time, there's no way you're gonna get it back in. Uh, it's just going to close the hole. So, I mean, you, you can call urology, but then it becomes an elective. The block catheters, irrigate them. Uh, very often, if you have a patient with blood clots and a blocked catheter, Rather than putting in a, a small three-way catheter or a big three-way catheter, sometimes you can get by with a good-sized Teeman 20 French catheter, two-way. Believe it or not, you can muscle out an awful lot of clots through a, an, even a two-way catheter, and it serves two purposes. It gives you a port, you get clots out, in and out evacuations, and also you decompress the bladder so that they're not in as much pain. Most people who have blood clots uh, effluxing from the bladder usually don't have an active bleed going on either. Usually settle down because the bladder is pretty good at clotting up once, once it hits a certain fullness level. Always look when the patient comes in from a nursing home, typically on a Friday night, with a catheter that is sort of hanging out about this far from the penis, uh, you know that that's in a bad spot. That's in a bad spot. That never made it up to the uh, bladder. So that will have to be removed and a gentle attempt will have to be tried to uh, put in a new one because they'll often have a false passageway from the, from the bladder, uh, from the bladder uh, being blown up. And so hematuria, uh, generally speaking, uh, I, 
in addition to all it said about hematuria, uh, the way to know if you've got a big problem is if you put say 50 cc's of saline or 20 cc's in and nothing comes out, you know you've got a problem. What goes in must come out generally. So that's kind of the acid test. If you put 50 cc's and you're getting 10 cc's out, you've got blockage or you have a leakage somewhere, but it's more likely just a blockage and there's still clots that need to come out. You really have to try and muscle the blood clots out. Guys, those are the 10 things you're gonna see over and over and over again. Uh, and so hopefully this has been of some use to you and I'll, we'll open it up for questions. We've got a few minutes left. Any questions, guys? Hey, Tony, it's Heather in Nebraska. Hi, Heather. Um, yeah. Hi, just a question about the kidney stone segment. Um, like when you yeah. said it's okay to use the Indesed uh, rather than the Flomax, like some yeah. of these people are pretty dry or they have like an AKI. Yeah. It's okay to that's, use the Indesed in that situation? No, no that, that that's a good point. Uh, you probably want to watch that. You don't want to deteriorate the renal function more. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing that after you've hydrated them, you're you're more likely to have success with them. You're right. In an AKI, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that too too readily. Okay. Thank yep. you. Okay. Go ahead, Victoria. Hey Tony, it's Victoria um, Smith. Thanks for the talk. Um, just to follow up on uh, Heather's question there, what dosing, you said Indesid 100 milligrams rectally, can they yeah. use like twice daily or what's the dose? I just recommend one at, one at night. One at night. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. to follow up for renal stones, like what size are we um, most likely referring to you? Cause we're pretty confident they're not going to pass on their own. Okay. Generally I'd say five plus centimeters, five plus millimeters. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. But with the Indesid, though, I've seen a few few whoppers exit like eight millimeters. So. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Tony. Uh, Dave Clark here. Can you hear me? Hi, Dave. Yeah, I can I, hear you. Yeah. So uh, I seem to be seeing a lot more uh, catheters stripping the urethra down through, through the to the base of the penis. Um, and uh, I mean, they ending up in, they're either coming, it can happen in the hospital or nursing home. Right. Um, how do you prevent that? Oh, there's, Dave, that's a great question because most of these individuals sit on their catheters are usually wheelchair bound yeah. well and sit on the area day in and day out. There's no simple fix usually. They, they sometimes just erode on their own. Um, what, I do, what I recommend in that case is, is be liberal with cling, stabilize the catheter so it doesn't have as much uh, pressure on the urethra ventrally. Now, having said that, a lot of people worry about that and say, wow, you know, it's split all the way down. Well, for starters, number one, they have not lost their sphincters. The sphincters still work fine. Number two, is a catheter placement harder? No, it's actually easier. I know that sounds terrible, but uh, there's no functional problem with that. It's more of a cosmetic thing. But I, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's many of these people are, as I said, are, are paraplegics, and it's always better to, if you can, to do intermittent cath than to have an indwelling. But most of these people have no option. And when you say cling, are you? You mean you're wrapping? Yeah, cling gauze. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like you try and mummify a little bit so it doesn't uh, break through the <laughs> ventral surface of the urethra. It's a really tough problem to solve. Because I've, I've heard about like trying to tape it upward up to the abdomen. You, you I, can try that. You can try that, but uh, sometimes nothing works, Dave. If they're if they're sitting on that for like twelve hours a day. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, okay. Sometimes it's just it's just ischemia is really what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think that's probably the 10 things that I think you're most likely to encounter. And I just wanted to give you kind of the stuff that's bailed me out many times. So some of these 
little tricks or things that it took me 20 years to figure out. So I just wanted to leave you with that as my uh, sort of my parting shot here. Um, I'm not retiring, but I'm just, uh, I think it's probably the last talk I'm going to give. And I could think nobody I'd rather give it to than the folks in Perry's. So thanks for your attention, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Thanks very much, guys. That's great. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, guys. All the best. Thank you, Tony. That was uh, very informative and very helpful, I think, for everybody.